Joining with us tonight in this session on Nehru and Post is none other than Professor Ram Shu Mukherjee. Sir is the most renowned historian of modern South Asian history. Sir is the present chancellor of Ashoka University. Previously, he was the visiting professor at Princeton University, University of Manchester, and University of California, Santa Cruz. He is internationally acclaimed as a historian of the revolt of 1857 in India and Indian independence movement. Sir was the editor of editorial pages at Telegram. Sir studied at Presidency College, Kolkata. Then, sir was studying study with Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and then at Saint Edmund Hall, Oxford University. Sir was awarded a degree in modern history by the University of Oxford in the year 1981. In Sir's first book, Agadir Revolt, 1857 to 58, a study of popular resistance has become a standard reference on the subject. Sir has looked at 1857 rebellion in four other works. Sir has also authored and edited several works on which are a standard of reference in the Rose series, including The Penguin Gandhi Leader, Politics and Trade in Indian Ocean World, Essays in Honor of Ashindar Gupta, Remember Childhood Essays in Honor of Andre Patel, Making of a Capital, Great Speeches of Modern India, Twilight Falls, Liberalism, Oxford, India, short introduction of Jawaharlal Nehru, and for us tonight, most importantly, Sir's work, Nehru and Post, Family Lives, published in the year 2014, is of our most importance. It is indeed a humble privilege and honor for us to listen and learn from you, Sir, on behalf of the entire Mountains team and on behalf of all the participants I welcome you, Sir, in this session. Without any further delay, we here by request Professor Rudran Shubhakarji to kindly take forward the session. Thank you so much, Sir. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm honored that you have asked me. As you, most of you probably know, today is a very special day in India. It's the Festival of Lights in India, and uh, in the encircling gloom that the coronavirus has uh, brought upon all of us, lights are very welcome. So I'm, I'm also privileged that I can. Uh, Be with all of you, or today of all days. So I'll try and speak for about forty uh, minutes or so, and then have a Q and A, and round off the whole thing within an hour, so that you are not completely drawn away from the celebrations. My team. I know there are two individuals involved here. Jawaharlal Nehru and Subhash Chandra Bose, but the underlying theme is that of a friendship that withered in the mind, a friendship that did not quite blossom, even though it had all the ingredients of becoming a very deep and genuine friendship. How that happened, how that transpired, is what I am going to talk about. They were born Nehru and Bose. I'll refer to them as Nehru and Bose. For them. So Nehru and Bose were born within nine years of each other, eight years of each other. Nehru being the senior and Bose the younger. Uh, both were born into relative affluence, though not the same levels of affluence, because. Nehru's father, Motilal Nehru, was an extremely wealthy man. Nehru was brought up in a large mansion with ha- which had its own swimming pool, which had its own tennis court, a retinue of servants, and so on and so forth. Uh, Bose's father was a very successful lawyer, very successful lawyer in Katak in Odisha, but he was successful enough and wealthy enough to build houses in a very uh, Tony area of Calcutta, if I may put it like that. So that also is a sign of his wealth. Uh, if we look at their educational backgrounds, because the educational backgrounds are important, there is also a level of similarity. They have both went to the University of Cambridge at different points, of course, because of their age gap. Uh, Nehru was, as a young child boy, rather, he was educated at home and then sent to the British public school Harrow 
from where he went to Trinity College, Cambridge to do a BSc degree in the natural sciences. He was not an outstanding student, but that is not to say he was a bad student. He was an above average student, but he was never at the top of his class or anything like that. Uh, Bose, on the other hand, was by any reckoning an outstanding student. He was ranked in his school leaving exam. He was ranked in his Bachelor of Arts examination from the University of Calcutta. And then persuaded by his father, he came to the University of Cambridge to study for the Indian Civil Service examination in which he stood fifth. Uh, the Indian Civil Service examination at that point of time was uh, entirely practical white dominated to stand fifth in such an examination was quite an achievement and it speaks for his intellectual acumen. But Bose was already when he even after he had done so well in the Indian civil service examination was already committed to the idea that he would commit himself to the cause of making the Indian nation free and therefore he chose not to work in the British Indian administration. He, after being appointed, he resigned from the Indian citizens, much to the disappointment of his parents. So he was take, already taking a defined and a different path. Nehru's path, on the other hand, after he left Cambridge, he qualified as a barrister at law and returned to India in 1912 as a graduate of the University of Cambridge and a trained barrister at law. And the expectation of his family, particularly of his father, was that he would take over his father's very successful legal practice in Allahabad. Nehru himself writes that when he came back to India in 1912, he had all the attitudes of a Western educated upper class prig. These words are not mine, these are Nehru's words to describe himself and his attitudes. So, uh, uh, you know, he was a snob, in other words, that was, that's, what he is, that's what he's saying. Nationalism was still, or working for India's freedom was still not a part of Nehru's consciousness. Uh, he becomes a nationalist in a very uh, what should I say unique way which I'm going to talk about and then come back to both of them, how he becomes a nationalist Nehru met Gandhi in 1915 uh, it was by no reckoning a love at first sight uh, Nehru found Gandhi to be very cold Gandhi didn't pay any attention to Nehru uh, because he probably found him too, too, too westernized but in the meantime, what happened? Events overtook both Gandhi and him. Uh, the Jallianwala Bagh massacre took place in April 1919, uh, when, as you probably all know, an unarmed crowd that was celebrating Baisakhi, the New Year, New Year Day in, in Punjab, in a garden, in an enclosed garden with only one exit, was fired upon by British police and military more than a 300, 350 people dead, more than a thousand people injured. This traumatized the Indian nation completely, that an unarmed people could be fired at in this manner. And the Congress decided that even though the British government had instituted an inquiry, they already guessed or they feared that this inquiry would be a whitewash, which it turned out to be. So the Congress decided to set up its own inquiry to find out what exactly had happened in the Punjab. And that responsibility of that inquiry committee was given to a very well-known Indian nationalist leader from Bengal, Chittaranjan Das, who was a, also a very successful lawyer and therefore very close to Jawala Nehru's father, Mutila Nehru. And Das requested Motilal Nehru, his friend, that, you know, 
I'm going to Punjab to collect evidence, etc. But I actually need somebody to help assist me when the time will come to draft this inquiry committee report. And why don't you allow Jawaharlal to do it? He's just come back from Cambridge. I'm sure his English is very good. And it'll be nice if he came to Punjab. So that's how Nehru goes to Punjab uh, as part of, not an official member of this inquiry committee, but as a part of the inquiry committee. And there he actually sees and hears for himself the horrors that British rule represented. And he is convinced, he writes a series of articles after he comes back from Punjab, where he actually describes British rule in India to be a barbaric regime. And he says, India has no future unless India and Indians can successfully throw over, overthrow British rule. And that's, this is the experience that leads him to the path of nationalism. By this time, 1920, uh, the non-cooperation movement has started. Gandhi has launched the non-cooperation movement. And in the course of the non-cooperation movement, another very formative experience Nehru undergoes. On a particular day in Allahabad in the winter of 1920, the news comes to him that a large number of peasants, as many as 400, 500 peasants, had gathered and were sitting on one of the carts of the Yamuna in Allahabad. Nehru rushed there to find out what was the purpose of this gathering, what did the, why had the peasants come, etc. And when he went there, uh, he was told that they had come to meet Gandhi and he said Gandhi is not in Allahabad and there is no immediate prospect of Gandhi's coming to Allahabad but could he help? And the peasants said, well you cannot help, we, have, we just want you or anybody of the Congress leadership, Gandhi, you or anybody else, to come with us our villages, which is, those villages were all in southeastern Uttar Pradesh in southeastern Awad, as the area was then called. Uh, today, those districts will be, if you look at a map of Uttar Pradesh, they will be districts like Sultanpur, Rai Bareli, Pratapgarh, Faizabad, and so on. So they said, we just wanted to come there. Uh, and see the conditions in which we live. So Nehru says that I can't go just now, but if we set up a time and a day uh, and you tell me where to go, I will be there. I'll come. And they sit, fix up an appointment and Nehru goes there. He keeps his word and he arrives. This is the westernized Jawaharlal Nehru's first exposure to the real rural India. And he writes this, writes about this experience over two chapters in his autobiography. He considered it so important to his, to his, to the so important a formative influence that, that he writes two chapters on this. In he calls it wandering among wandering among Kisans. So he is with the peasants. This is the first visit, but he keeps going back. And he sees the wretched conditions in which these people live, oppressed, exploited by the British government, by the large landholders who were called Talukdars in southeastern Howard. And he actually not just sees, he stays with them. Sometimes sitting, sleeping on a charpoy under a tree or in their little cottages, sharing their food, the uh, roti and the sabsi. Nehru actually witnesses in the course of these visits an ongoing peasant rebellion against oppression. And he, dis he vividly describes this. He would say that we would arrive in a village and then the Rai would go out, Sitaram, and it 
would be carried that from village to village this cry would be back and he said in a matter of minutes 15 20 minutes 5000 4000 people would gather in a village gather on a field and he said and then i would be asked to speak to these people he had never been a public speaker if anything he had been a very shy speaker in fact in cambridge he was a member of a debating society where he he had been fined because he hadn't spoken so he was forced to speak he said these people expected me to speak what could i do but not speak to them and that's how nehru becomes a public speaker and develops in his own style of public speaking which was never rabble rousing which was never rhetorical or rabble rousing he spoke very simply to them chatting to them so his public speaking was always chatting never speaking down but it's a kind of a conversation and he that's how he trained himself became a self trained public speaker thrown into the deep end of the pool if you want to say that and he that's one thing he learned the other thing he learned he said in the course of the movement moving with these peasants i also learned the lessons of non violence that these people were actually protesting against their oppression sometimes even against violence in the most non violent of ways and he says on the one hand i was learning from gandhi who was spreading the word of ahimsa and but more directly experientially i was also learning from these kisans so this is nehru's baptism in the internet from the baptism that stays with him the conviction stays with him for the rest of his life he is no longer that westernized individual that he was in 1912 when he came back he is a transformed completely transformed person because of these experiences jallianalabagh and then wandering some of the kisans and of course the influence of gandhi 1921 when nehru actually is wandering among the kisans boss returns from england he lands in bombay his mind is already made up he has resigned from the indian civil service he's already made up that he will become a worker in the indian for the and in the indian national so when he ship docks in bombay even before he has collected his luggage he goes to see gandhi he he had heard gandhi was in india he knew the address where gandhi would be and he goes to see gandhi and he he also in his autobiography leaves behind an account of this meeting he was the only he was the only person there in western clothes everybody was sitting on the floor on a white sheet as on a farash as we would say so he goes there sits rather uncomfortably on the floor in his western clothes and gandhi and he they have a very long two hour long chat conversation where boss wants to know gandhi's future plans what he wants to do with the non cooperation movement what he means by swaraj and so on so forth. uh it's not that Bose came away from that meeting completely convinced. He he writes, "I still had a lot of uh, unanswered questions in my mind." But I, he also says, "I could see that this man was indisputably the most important leader of the Indian national movement." And Gandhi gives him a very sage piece of advice. He says that I can see that you are committed to working. my advice would be that you go to bengal where you come from and there is mr das gandhi had a lot of time and respect for sir das and he said mr das is leading the non cooperation movement in bengal go to him and work with him and that's exactly what bose does bose's baptism in the indian nationalism is working as das's closest lieutenant in bengal so this is how the two people parallel lines right 
they come into Indian national uh, In Nehru's life, and this was also going to happen again, and it was going to happen in Bose as well. In Nehru's life, it would happen again, and it would happen in Bose's life as well. For very personal reasons, personal reason being his wife's illness. His wife kept very bad health. Nehru has to go in 1926 for his wife's treatment to Europe, and this is his return to the West, if you like, after his student days. And uh, this is a Europe that has is still coming out of the ravages of the First World War. And Nehru goes there and he meets a series of, through connections, friends, he meets a number of people who are, he, he find, he discovers, are concerned about the adverse impact that British imperialism is having on the people, the economy of countries in Asia and Africa. And there is something, an organization that has been born out of this called the League Against Imperialism. Nehru joins that League Against Imperialism and he is made the spokesman for India. This is an important development because what Nehru brings back from this visit of his is the awareness that India's struggle for freedom, India's struggle for independence cannot be viewed in isolation. It's part of a larger Afro-Asian movement and struggle. That's how it should be seen. It's a, it's a phenomena a, that is a part of a wider anti-imperialist movement. So he returns in 1927 and there's a Congress session in Madras in 1927, in which both Bose and Nehru, Bose cannot come to that meeting, but he connects with Nehru. And both of them say that the Congress is taking too mild a line towards British imperialism, British rule in India. They are accepting, they're looking for concessions from the British rulers. He said, they both of them argue that the time for looking for concessions is over. Indians should now demand complete independence. The phrase that was used was Purna Swaraj, complete independence. And Gandhi and a group around Gandhi who was labeled the old guard. So these are the old guard of the Congress. He and Nehru represent the new guard of the Congress, if you like. He's, Gandhi and the old guard are not quite enthusiastic about complete independence at that juncture. They are not ruling it out. They are, Gandhi writes to Nehru and says, I think you and Bose are trying to go too fast. I have, in principle, I have nothing against Purna Swaraj. That is what we should try and achieve. But you are going too fast. Anyway, there is no stopping these two young men who have been radicalized in, in different ways. And in 1929, when the Congress meets and Nehru, uh, somewhat prompted by Motilal, his father, who was Gandhi's close friend and associate, is the president of the 1930, 1929 session of the Indian National Congress. At that point of time, the youngest president ever of the Indian National Congress. It was held in Lahore uh, over the New Year, 29-30. And on the 31st of December in the Lahore Congress, uh, the Purna Swaraj resolution is passed. By this time, between 27 and 29-30, Gandhi has also come around to the view that, yes, these young people are actually right. We have to go in for Purna Swaraj. And so the Purna Swaraj resolution is drafted by Nehru. It is presented by Gandhi, but at the back of it, Bose and Nehru had actually worked 
together to prepare this Purna Swaraj So it's passed. Gandhi presenting it before the Congress, it is passed. And this leads in March, April to the civil disobedience movement. Gandhi decides that he is going to break British law. And his dramatic way of breaking British law is to manufacture salt, which manufacture of which was illegal under the British government, under the British laws. That's the Great Dundee March, etc. So both Bose and Nehru, in their different parts of the one in Allahabad, another in Calcutta, are arrested. Uh, and they serve long terms in prison. Bose, in fact, is badly beaten up and also he is moved from Calcutta to Rangoon where he takes very seriously ill and he is not allowed to return to India even for medical treatment. So his elder brother signs a document on behalf of Bose that Bose will not come to India but he will travel directly to Europe for medical treatment and that's how Bose arrives in Europe around 1932-33 in Vienna okay. and uh, he takes medical treatment but also this is a further period of radicalization of Bose as well. I'll come to it in, in a minute. Coincident 33-34 is also a period that Nehru has to go to Europe again for the same reason. His wife is now even more critically ill. She's in fact dying. And both of them go through what I call a phase of a very serious ideological reorientation, radicalization is what I call it. Why? Because the Europe that they see in the 1930s is a different Europe than what they had experienced it in 19, the 1920s. This is a Europe that has been hit by the economic depression following the crash of 1929. There's large-scale unemployment, soaring inflation. Therefore, large, very large movements of social discontent. Unemployment, inflation are the ingredients of social movements, social discontent, displays of social discontent. And these movements take two very distinct directions. One is one follows from the analysis made by a group of people that this economic depression actually is the sign of a very deep-rooted crisis in capitalism. Capitalism is coming to an end. And we must try to take advantage of this crisis in capitalism and establish in its place a new system of economic production, a new society based on equality, justice, fairness, etc. And that is that will be socialism. And the model for that, they say, is Soviet Russia. Already, they say this is an experiment that is going on in Soviet Russia, and we should try and try out that kind of experiment, experiment in other countries of Europe, particularly Germany. It's very strong in Germany. The second is a movement that is in, goes in the opposite direction. It says that these shows of social discontent, etc., etc., need to be stamped out. What Europe needs now is greater discipline, not social discontent. We do not need democracy. 
all these this talk about democracy liberty freedom etc they should all be stamped on and a new kind of society should be established based upon military power militarization of europe with lead to the discipline of europe this is fascism both nehru and bos are exposed to these ideas socialism and fascism nehru almost immediately takes takes to the socialist path is convinced that this is where the future lies bos is somewhat ambiguous he believes in socialism but he also believes in discipline particularly in a country like india he believes discipline is of paramount importance what india needs today is discipline and he believes that there can be a fusion between socialism and fascism fascism need not be only the destruction of democratic rights and liberties one reason for this one reason for this and here and go, going back a little pausing and going back a little is from from a very young age bos had a fascination for things military he uh, tried to join the army he failed because of his insight and in one of the in the 98 1928 session of the indian national congress held in calcutta he was of course in charge of organizing it and he gave himself the grand title general officer commanding and he actually wore a military uniform there's a great picture of he receiving the congress president motilal nehru in hara station in calcutta and motilal nehru is dressed in khadar kurta and dhoti and there is bos resplendent in a military uniform so there was this fascination and uh, the militaristic aspects of fascism captured both bos's fancy this is one reason why he is taken up by fascism and this has very important implications for what is going to happen in the future so this is how the awareness the ideological and the intellectual orientations of these two young men are changing they are also in close touch you may not physically they are writing to each other long correspondence discussing ideas discussing books and the relationship develops through this it develops to such an extent that when nehru's wife dies or is dying the only person other than nehru daughter only person next to nehru is bos and bos actually makes the funeral funeral arrangements of kamala nehru so this is that kind of a close relationship and one sign of the close relationship is that the letters that they exchange began very formally or began in very formal tones so the sign off would be with regards shubhash chandra bos and through the course of time as the exchange deepened this sign off changes with love shubhash with love jawala so so this is a sign that the bonds between them are also undergoing a change they're coming closer to each other and they return to india and the correspondence continues nil bos is again in jail not in jail actually he is in under house arrest and from within that from that house arrest he is writing to nehru to send him books he said i desperately need reading matter and do you have this book do you have that book can you get me this can you get me that and it's it's an interesting list that he is giving to me uh, they are all kind of books that are somewhat left tilted so 
some of the books nehru can send he has them in his personal library some he can't but anyway that's the to and fro that goes on between the two of them in the course of this while this is going on at the personal level at the political level nehru is elected for elected congress president for the second time in 1936 the session is held in lucknow it's rather a important and a landmark session landmark because of the speech actually that nehru gave he stands up as the president of the congress and i think this is the only time ever in the history of the indian national congress that a, that a president gave his address and began his address addressed the gathering with one single word he said comrades okay he didn't say fellow delegates friends etc he said comrades that tells you his intellectual and ideological orientation at that point of time and the second paragraph of this speech was actually devoted to shubhash he says look at this couple he they are holding our dear co-worker friend with no charge at all and we demand that shubhash be free so that's the second paragraph but the rest of the speech is more important nehru says that just political independence political freedom from british rule will be a very vacuous freedom what india and indians need is economic independence where there will be programs to establish economic equality and economic justice and this can only be achieved through socialism so the congress should put socialism on top of its agenda i'm summarizing for reasons of time the old guard as most called are alarmed that the congress president is actually talking about socialism. so socialism and they write to gandhi and they say that you better tame this son of yours he is going to destroy everything that we are working on so gandhi says if you feel so strongly about nehru about jawaharlal and his speech you should resign i advise you to resign from the work so seven members of the work very important people vallabhai patel rajagopal achari rajendra prasad govind vallabh pant and so on they actually resigned from the work and ne- there's no hide and seek in this gandhi writes to nehru and says they have actually resigned from at my advice so you shouldn't think that i'm not involved in this but you are free as the congress president to build your own working committee nehru replies back and saying that if i were a higher president i am meaning a dignity if i were a dignified president i would resign but it so happens i'm a pay higher president shameless president i am going to stick because i haven't taken on this job to quit under pressure so what they arrive at some kind of a working formula and the they resign they the resigned members withdraw their resignations and they become again form the working committee and vallabhai patel writes to gandhi somewhat gloating he said working with jawaharlal is now like a dream i hold time now this episode is important because this is a kind of a dry run to what will happen to subhash two years down the line so after nehru subhash is made president and nehru and subhash work very closely together in fact subhash takes the 
program of socialism one step further by, by, by forming a planning committee. This is the, if you like, the embryo of what became the planning commission. And he appoints Nehru the vice chairman because the Congress that's president is ex officio. says this is one job that I love to do. So that's what's happening. They're still working very closely together. Now, in 1938-39, Bose decides to stand a second time. Now the entire Congress, starting with Gandhi and all the members of the old guard, are against Bose's seeking a second term. But Bose is adamant. Nehru advises Bose, he says, look, you and I have much better things and much more important things to do than running the Congress organization. So my advice would be to not to seek the presidency, but let's do other work from within the ranks of the Congress. We can do much more work for the people of India. So anyway, Bose is fixated on the idea that he would do a second term. Gandhi sets up his own candidate, Patabi Sitaramaya, who is handsomely defeated by Bose. Okay. Now, here comes, I said, the dry run that had... Bose is made to go through the exact... exactly what had been done to him. Okay. Except for Nehru, the entire working committee resigns. Bose is left without a working committee. When the AICC meets, uh, when the AICC meets, Tripuri, I think it meets in Tripuri, there's a resolution passed. The resolution is drafted by Raja Gopalachari, but it was presented by Govind Balla Pant, so it has come to be known as the Pant Resolution. But we know now that it was actually drafted by Raja Gopalachari, where it was said that the Congress president when it when he forms the working committee must get the consent of gandhi for every member of the working committee in other words gandhi should choose the working committee gandhi is not present at the tripuri congress huh? that's very important to remember so now here you have a president no working committee and the working committee, he cannot even form his own working committee because Gandhi has to approve of that working committee. So, Bose reaches out to Gandhi and he says, tell me who you want in the working committee or let's come to some kind of a formula. Six persons I will choose, six persons you will choose and then we'll have a working committee. Gandhi says, I have no idea about this punk resolution. I don't know why it was passed. You are the president. You have the right to form your working committee. Go ahead and form your working committee. Okay. Now, this is a boss actually is being pushed into a corner because if he forms his own working committee, the AICC will say, does it have Gandhi's approval? Gandhi will say, no, the Congress committee president formed the working, working committee. Okay. So it will be a stalemate. So there is a exchange of letters between Gandhi, Gandhi and Bose trying to arrive at some kind of a compromise. The only person, the only person who is actually intervening in this is Nehru. And he's intervening on the side of Bose. He's writing to Gandhi to say, Babu, please sit down with Bose. Please sit down with Shubhash. Shubhash tends to be emotional, tends to overreact, but he is a man with a good heart and he will listen to reason. If you speak to him, he will listen to you. Please meet him. Please meet him. But Gandhi, for this is Gandhi at his worst, he actually refuses to meet Shubhash and doesn't pay any attention to the suggestions that Nehru is making. Shubhash directly reaches out to Nehru. He says, I am near Dhanbad. I'm, I am actually recovering from typhoid. I cannot come to Allahabad. Can you come here? Even for a day, we need to 
talk. Nehru wires Gandhi and Sri Gandhi says, Subhash wants to meet. I cannot mark those words. I cannot say no to Subhash. Okay? And so he goes to Dhanwar. Unfortunately, we do not have any record of that conversation that took place. Neither side kept an account, gave an account of that conversation. So we don't know what happened. But anyway, the impasse continued when the Congress met in Calcutta. Shubhash resigned. Oh, his resignation was accepted with one dissenting voice, Nehru saying, don't accept the resignation. And Nehru left the Congress meeting, actually. Bose leaves not only the meeting, he leaves the Congress, forms his own party, the Forward Club. And then, of course, events take a very dramatic turn. Bose is imprisoned by the British once again from house arrest. He escapes, a dramatic escape, as the story is very well known. He travels in disguise to Kabul, to Peshawar, and then onwards to Berlin, where he seeks the help of Hitler uh, to get India's independence. He is actually very well received in Nazi Germany. Very well received. He's, He's given a flat, a house with a garden, a car with unlimited petrol, a gardener, a cook, a servant. Whenever there are negotiations between the Axis powers, Bose is made to sit on the Nazi Germany side and so on and so forth. So he's actually, he meets Hitler only once, where he greets Hitler as an old revolutionary, but Hitler disappoints him. Hitler says, look, there is no way I am going to invade India as you want me to, to free the British people from, from, to free the Indian people from British. I suggest that you go to Japan. There is a submarine leaving from Marseille. I can arrange for you to be in that submarine and another Japanese submarine will pick you up from the coast of Africa and you can go to the southeastern theater of the war with at that point of time, 1942, the Japanese are completely dominating. So that's what Bose does. It's a very dramatic journey. That's what Bose does. And from Singapore, he organizes the Indian National Army. Uh, a force that, with the help of the Japanese army, will march into India. That's the aim and aspiration will march into India to free India from British rule. Now, very significant, when Bose is about to embark on this epoch-making military venture, he actually, he sets up a radio station from Singapore. It's called Free India Radio Station. The first broadcast is by Bose himself, quite understand. But the first broadcast is meant for only one person, even though everybody gets to hear it. It's meant for only one person, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. And Bose says that it's the first time that anybody calls Gandhi father of the nation. He says, you are the father of the nation. We are coming. Our ways are different, but our goal is the same. And you are the undisputed leader of the Indian freedom struggle. So when we come to India, we will come to you first and lay down our arms at your feet and work exactly the way you tell us to. So, and also very interesting, when people talk about the Indian National Army, everybody talks about the fact that he called one of his regiments the Chasi Rani of Chasi Regiment okay, after Lakshmi. It was an old woman's regiment. But what were some of the other regiments called? Gandhi Regiment, Nehru Regiment, Patel Regiment. So it's not as if Bose was completely abandoning his Congress heritage. So they come to Northeast India. The Japanese army is defeated. Therefore, the Indian National Army is also defeated. The retreat starts. And it, it's, it is a very rough retreat. So through severe, very bad terrain. And 
by this time the american forces and the british forces have reconquered southeast asia they are running the japanese are being defeated in every theater of the war and bose knows he, his days are numbered because if he is caught by the allied troops he will be charged with treason and so on and so forth so he tries to escape and the story is that the plane he was trying to that he took to go to japan got fire crashed and he died of severe burns in that air crash now i know there's a lot of controversy about this but i just want to say as a student of history i have looked at all the available evidence and the available evidence i understand underline the word available evidence Available evidence suggests that Bose died in that air crash. Now, till we have different other kinds of evidence to the contrary, we have to stay with this account. Okay. Whether we like it or not, this is the only historical account that is possible from the documentation. Everything else is a figment of somebody or somebody's imagination. So let's not go into that. As facts stand, facts can change. history tells us that facts can change anyway so boss to put it in a different way disappears from the scene when the news comes to india to nehru that probably boss has died in the air crash i would this is say that nehru right even though in the period when boss has sought the alliance of nazi germany and the japanese nehru had been his most severe critic he said boss is a patriot he is like my younger brother i've always treated him like my younger brother but he is now completely misguided no fascist power can bring freedom to the people of india the people of india can bring freedom to the people not a fascist power like nazi germany or japan so if boss thinks this is going to happen he is completely living in a world of delusion and i will oppose him okay so but that critique that opposition is lost when he hears that his quote on quote younger brother has probably died and gandhi also says that we might have deferred but boss shukash was like my prodigal son i knew one day he would come back to the fold but now unfortunately he is gone so boss never quite in the periods even when they were friends he always thought that between gandhi and bose nehru preferred gandhi he once said very perceptively he said jawaharlal's head is with socialism jawaharlal's heart is with gandhi very perceptive comment so why was this we need to answer that question and i will end with this little anecdote in july 1938 vallabhai patel gandhi's closest left writes to nehru nehru has just visited gandhi in seva pra so i'm going to paraphrase part of the letter and then give you the punch line the most important line so patel writes you were here a week ago and you probably had an exchange of very hard and unpleasant words with gandhi since you left papu has not been the same person he hardly talks he hardly eats when he talks he says if chawar thinks like this of me maybe i should retire from public life 
content that helps you. Please come back. Come back as soon as you come, soon as you can, and put palm in the old man's wounds as only you can do. And then this is the punchline. He says, "Perhaps you don't know. Perhaps you don't know. Babu loves you more than anyone else in the world. Babu loves you more than anyone else." In the world. This was not a poem that Nehru was willing to pray even for a younger brother. Thank you. so much sir for taking your time from your busy schedule to talk to us on Nehru and Bose it was definitely an informative session i'm sure that we are we have all learned something and i've learned at least some misconceptions on lives of nehru and bose with the end of the talk i'm sure there are a lot of questions that are there in everyone's minds so without any further delay we shall now move on to the question and answer session if you have a question please raise your question to the speaker you'll be allowed to unmute your microphone by the moderator Only during this time, facilitate better discussion. Introduce yourself first, then ask your question. Please raise your hand with your question. So the floor is open for questions. Are there any questions? Yes, first question. So there is a question. <laughs> Is based by Jay from University of Oxford. So he has sent. He is a Rhodes Scholar, and he has sent a question through the chat box. So his question is: Is India's loss in Indo-Sino war is it due to the Fabian strategy of Nehru's Fabian socialist ideological forbearance? So what is your take? I don't see how this question has any relevance to what we are talking. About. I am not talking about Nehru here. I am talking about a very particular relationship between Nehru and Bos. So what? Nehru did in 62 or what he didn't do with in 62 is not within the purview of my knowledge i have not worked any worked on this subject in any great detail so i am unable to answer this question but more importantly i think this question is rather irrelevant for this session for another kind of a session for nehru's prime ministership it or for indo soviet relations indo sino indian relations it could be of any relevant not in a discussion on the relationship between Bose and Nehru i'm sorry if uh, that disappoints you but that's how i see i think as the moderator you should allow only relevant questions okay. so next question has been raised by mahadev swami mr mahadev swami please raise your question mr mahadev swami we have your floor You have to unmute yourself, Madhav Swami. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I have unmuted, Carry sir. On. Actually, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Yeah. Carry on. Carry on. Hello, sir. Drudvansh uh, Prasmeshan actually have provided us. Carry on. Uh. I am calling from Karnataka. Yes. Hello. Yes. Carry on. I am calling from Karnataka. Yes. What Sir. is the question? Sir, actually, my question is: uh, after 1935, that uh, the Congress session, actually, the second session, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose was won that uh, election. That's 38. Against Patavi Sitaramaya. Not thirty-five. I said he won that election. He won it very handsomely. Hello. Yes. I think there is a network issue over there. Can we move forward to the next question? <laughs> Actually, my directly I'm asking question. Actually, after uh, defeated Maya in the election, at that time Gandhi had expressed that actually that his uh, Patavi Sitaramaya's uh, defeat is my personal. Yes, he did. He did because Patavi Sitaramaya was his own candidate. 
Patavi Sitarama didn't even know that he had been put up as a candidate. Patavi Sitarama writes about Yeah, yeah, he, uh, of course. Right. Yeah. So it was Gandhi's defeat because the Patavi Sitarama was Gandhi's personal choice. Gandhi was just straight, stating an obvious truth. Let's move, move on to the next question. So next question is from uh, Chris Rio Jensen from Our Lady Fatima University, Manila. His question is, so the various files were declassified on Subhash Chandra Bose and on Nehru, but many are not yet being declassified. So could you throw some light on these declassified documents on life of Nehru and Bose? So the declassified files that you're talking about are all relating to Bose, not on Nehru. So, most of the files relating to Nehru are there already existing in the Nehru papers that are kept in the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. They are not in the government's possession any longer. Uh, in Bose's case, there were some papers that were, hadn't been declassified earlier. They have been declassified by this government. but. In spite of the expectations that these files would have dramatic information about Bose's quote-unquote disappearance, there is actually nothing of any significance in these files. So you will have noticed that the brouhaha about these files has died down because there is nothing there in this file that adds in any significant way to our information about Bose. Next question, sir, is from uh, Jonathan. He's from Christ University. His question is Nehru and his public persona was crafted in particular light for the longest time, often as the perfect leader. Emma Madai, the secretary, was one of the few writers who eligibly tried to highlight the imperfect side and imperfect relationship between Nehru and Bose. In this context, sir, these memoirs have been heavily censored as well, as well as on the same, same, same side. Could you throw some light on the credibility of these counter narratives on Nehru and Boss? I cannot uh, throw any uh, light on the counter narrative, but uh, all research shows that Matha is a very unreliable witness on many counts. For example, Mathai says, it, I'll just give you one very well known example. That the famous phrase, phrase tryst with destiny that Nehru used uh, in his midnight speech 1914, 14th, uh, 15th August 1947, was suggested by Mathai himself. This is not correct because G probably Girja Shankar Bajpai suggested uh, when Nehru showed him the speech, it was Girja Shankar Bajpai who suggested this phrase. So Mathai has a great he inflated idea of his own importance and he makes up stories about this, uh, about himself and the role he played. So he's a very unreliable, very, very unreliable witness. And I also don't think his account was censored. His book came out, it was published, and it has died down. I mean, it, nobody considers that book valuable anymore, except people who want to attack Nehru and sensational, sensas, sensationalize on misconceptions and misinformation that that book contains. As a student of history, I don't give put any value to Mathai's account. There are other counter narratives about Nehru, by the way. Okay, but Mathai, I'm not going to rely on. Uh, next question is from Gokul from TIS. So his question is, what was Nehru's take on INA trial? A very interesting question. Nehru, after 1919, in 1946, donned his barrister's gown for the first time, 1919 to 1946. So he hadn't ever appeared in a case in this long period, but he decided to appear for the INA prisoners in the INA trials. And then, because he's all he's, he's their counsel, he goes to meet them in prison, talks to them, 
and he says he comes back to one of those meetings and he says that i had no idea because most of the time when subhash was leading the indian national army i was in jail and i didn't have any information what a kind of hero subhash actually was how he had inspired this how secular he was and how he had stood up to the bullying of the japanese generals and he said who knows in a similar situation i would have behaved exactly like netaji this is the first time that nehru uses the epithet netaji for subhash previously it was always subhash so he says netaji after his meeting with the ina officers and he does appear he is the there are three lawyers that appear for the ina officers uh, sapru gulabai desai and nehru sapru and gulabai desai are by far the most senior and the wiser counsels but nehru also appears for them. and that that meeting is very important in fact it, uh, Nehru is forced to revise some of his conceptions about Ashoka. Thank One you. of those persons, it's very, very touching anecdote. One of those persons told, either he told Nehru or he said this in the presence of Nehru. So this person was asked, so all the sacrifices that you have made, you gave up everything to join the Indian. was it worth it and he said netaji embraced me and called me his brother that has made my life thank you sir with this we now come to the end of this enlightening session due to lack of time Thank you so much, sir, for such an enlightening talk. And I'm indeed sure we all learned and unlearned a lot of things tonight. On behalf of the entire auditorium team and the participants, I take this opportunity to express our gratitude, sincere gratitude to you, sir. Also thanking the entire participants who joined with us tonight to listen to sir and learn from sir.